you know, we came off of shop floors in the 60s and the 70s with time study engineering. How many people remember, how many people know about time study engineering? Okay, well, time study engineering was, <laughs> remember we brought the industrial engineer out, we put him next to the hourly guy. <laughs> the real smart industrial engineer sat there, time studied the poor hourly guy, okay? And all of a sudden he gave him an incredible right. What does the hourly guy look at the industrial engineer? What does he say? If you could do it that fast, why don't you do it, right? Okay, so, you know, this, this conceptual idea that leadership sets standards for people that are totally out of bounds is, is totally understandable from the standpoint is that if you don't teach them what the bounds are, okay, then they're going to believe that we're asking them to do more, you know, ask work harder for less money or less rewards, all right? So how did this all start? I came out of the Frederick Taylor Industrial Society, and I was taught how to build big tractors, really big tractors. I worked in a factory, had 4,000 people in it. And I, you um, did your job, nothing more, nothing less. You had very limited accountabilities, and your accountabilities had nothing to do with the company whatsoever. All right? I was to put a tractor on a, on a freight on a railroad car and ship it all over the world, whether it's Russia or Poland, all right, and that factory or that engine or that uh, crawler tractor had to have pretty paint and it had to have the right rollers on it and had the right specifications. And I was trained in all kinds of elements of manufacturing. If you live in manufacturing, we can time study a Nancy ass in manufacturing. We are so metric driven in terms of the product itself. It's incredible, okay? And in those 14 years, I probably worked with over 2,000 people, all kinds of unions and all kinds of different uh, situations. And it was primarily um, the leadership style was confrontational management. I mean, that's basically what it is, all right? And um, it was a, a, a very, very, very difficult period of time, and we hit a recession in the 80s. Uh, by that particular point in time, they had asked me to run a factory in Springfield, Missouri. I grew up in Chicago. So I built all these crawler tractors. I could build a crawler tractor and learn a little bit about physics, a little bit about chemistry, okay? I could build an engine. I could put it in a truck. I could, it would come at your families at 60, 70, 100 miles an hour. They trusted me to do that. But when it came down to anything related to the financial of the companies, I wasn't qualified. Every, we didn't have even the cost that went into the tractor. Uh, we didn't even have the labor costs that went into the tractor. We did not have the overhead that went into the tractor. We weren't involved in the industrial policies, human relations, skills, okay, because this was a 115,000 employee company, and it had to be negotiated downtown. So all we had was safety, quality, housekeeping, <laughs> all right, and our minds were trained to create a great product, right? Not once. Not once in 14 years did they ever tell us that our job was to create a great company. Not once. And I'll tell you, we did this from the 19, early 1900s all the way to 1970. If a management fad came along, our top management, we would buy the fad. And he, oh, you guys are too, I, I tell you, we had, a, we had one program, okay, in terms of leadership, in terms of whether your employees trusted you or not, you got in a circle, and you were to fall backwards, all right? Now, you're laughing at me, but do you remember this? Yeah. I had more people get concussions in my company because <laughs> we didn't care about the SOB. I mean, we just let them fall, you know? Well, that was a short-lived <laughs> management practice, okay? But I remember two TQM? All right, listen to T TQM. They taught, us and they taught us that this is the, what they put into our brains. They said... If you do this, it will change your life forever, all right? Total quality management has nothing to do with money. Did you ever hear that one? All right. I personally think that TQM came as a result of very frustrated quality people that wanted to move up in the organization chart, okay? So they could report to the C-suite in the organization, right? They did, then they designed a whole mess of overhead, okay, just to define what statistical process control was, all right? So we would get all our guys together and said, Man, this is it. You know, we finally got the last leadership program we're going to have here. I mean, it's been proven all over the world. Okay, we're going to put it in here. We're already behind. Let's do it. We're going to change the world, and we ended up laying people off. It was crazy, okay? And we, but we, every single bit of dog food that came along, we lapped it up. And every time we would go out to our guys in the shop floor, what do you think our guys in the shop floor said when we came in with this new practice? 
don't listen to them. In six months, <laughs> six months, there's going to be another one. We got a museum down there, okay? And just don't listen to them. And they were basically right. All right, so now the big recession hits in the 80s, right? And it, it is devastating. What happens is we cannot compete on a global basis. And all of a sudden, we get global competition. And it came in everywhere, all right? It, it started in the east. And it started in the 50s, and we got components from the East, and all of a sudden they had inferior quality, and we had an arrogant attitude in the United States. said, heck, you know, we don't have to worry about these guys. Who are these guys? We don't have to worry about these guys, right? But then they started to do some really crazy stuff. They actually had the audacity to go ask our customers what they wanted in their product. Can you imagine anybody being so stupid to go <laughs> to an automobile and say, what would you like in your car, okay? And then they would say, actually do it. Well... Not only did they listen to the consumer, but they went back and they, they manufactured at lightning speed, okay? So they started to bring these products in. When, when the East co decided to compete against us in tractors, they dropped off Komatsu tractors in San Diego, and every one of them had cat killer written on the windshield, all right? And we were like only third relative to the market share, so they were going directly at the biggest manufacturers in terms of the United States. And we laughed and didn't think it was funny. You know, we didn't think they'd live. And all of a sudden, they grew market share and they took market share. And then we, all of a sudden, lost sales. And so by the 1980s, okay, we got a real significant crisis on our hands, all right? Because we can no longer compete. We are, we are dead with overhead, all right? And so obviously, we have to start chucking assets. We're not have sales, we got high overhead, and so we go on the worst layoff in the history of this company. We went from 115,000 people to 11,000 people in two years. Wow. Yeah, we laid off 1,000 people a week for two years. Who was here from Louisville? I was talking to someone from Louisville. He remembers the International Harvester Factory right on the airport. We had 8,000 people in there at one time. 8,000 people, all right? We, was, we just, and then when we closed factories, it was a hard crash, a really hard crash. There was no safety nuts, okay? Unemployment in 1983 was 12%, 12%. Anybody wanna know what interest rates were in 1983? Uh, what, 22? 18 was a variable. <laughs> you can get a variable for 18, okay? All right, by that time, I had um, gone through the, the gauntlet, and they told me in uh, 1978 to go to Springfield, Missouri. I'm from Chicago. I grew up in the streets of Chicago and in the western suburbs. I spent my entire life since I was 19 years old in this one factory. And now they say, take this plant and um, either turn it around or close the factory. That was my assignment. So, so I come down here, and uh, I went to, in the, into the factory. And I, it was the most incredible change. In, in Chicago, when um, we would try to get somebody together and talk about teamwork and talk about loyalty and th things like that, uh, we, could never, we could never get the people together, okay? Because when you left Melrose Park, Illinois, you went back to three states. You didn't go back to a city or you didn't go back to a suburb or you didn't go back to a community like Austin, okay? You went back to Indiana, Wisconsin, Illinois. Okay, so this is all like the camaraderie and teamwork and play baseball together and, you know, know each other's families and, you know, everybody. There, was, there was none of that, okay? So when it came in here and all of a sudden, boy, these guys are community. They like each other, okay? But what was even more weird is they, they came to me and said, uh, look, we know how to do this. Uh, get me the tools to do the job and stay the hell out of our way. And for a real lazy person like me, that is like a gift from God, you know? <laughs> really? <laughs> really? You guys just want the tools to do the job? Well, hell, I'll get to do the job. But you see, but this was an entrepreneurial community, okay? They came off the farms. You know, they had a different kind of attitude when they, when they came to work, okay? They always knew how to fix stuff, all right? But yet they weren't allowed to express their entrepreneurial opportunities because it was process, it was this, it was no thinking, it was... We, there was no creativity whatsoever. So they didn't even know how bad they were, to be frank with you. Right? The corporate office knew how bad, but they had no idea. And they took great pride in being bad, but they didn't know they were bad. Okay, so it wasn't too hard to get them on a winning track. Okay, and this is all about what you know, the great game is all about. It's like creating small wins okay, that build into big wins. 
and everybody wants to be winners, but no one has really analyzed the fact that it's not a, it's, it's not one big win. Okay, it's accumulation of small wins all throughout your organization to get into this mode of feeling good about winning. Okay, so we ran the organization from seventy eight to eighty two, and and we smoked it. We took on every corporate goal you could ever imagine. Our biggest thrill was getting the CEO of the company to get in his private jet, come down here, and have to give awards to the people. And you know why we, we did that? Because he hated to do it. <laughs> <laughs> this guy flies in to give the safety award, and we, we went out there and we rented chairs from the uh, funeral home, all right, so our all our associates could sit in one room. Ladies went home and they, they got their hair all done, and guys got you know dirt under their fingernails okay and everybody's sitting in the seat of their chair just dying to get this award okay and they were really proud of being able to have this award and they thought that this guy was going to give us great words of wisdom right and he gets up there and his name is warren hafer and he goes uh, you know how to improve your safety record and everybody got real close and said we can't wait to hear this right he goes get rid of people he said without people you can't get hurt <laughs> I, was, I, 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 oh, I almost took a folding chair. Okay. <laughs> I, I, if somebody wasn't sitting on that folding chair, I would be in jail today. Okay. I mean, this is the mindset. Okay. They could care less about people than what we'd ever witnessed before. This, the truth of the matter is I concocted this idea that if I thought that I could lead them and ask them if they wanted to buy the company, I could clear my own conscience and my own guilt, and I would at least came to them with a plan saying, at least I tried. And I really thought that if I went out there and asked them if they wanted to buy the company, that somebody in the audience would say, what do you know about running a company? You can build a tractor, we know that, or you know something about an engine, we know that, but what, you know, run a company? And I thought for sure, at that particular point, I'd say, you're absolutely right. I tried. <laughs> well, wait to see what happens, right? So we call everybody in, and I s said, don't get married. Don't buy a car. Don't buy a house. Don't take on any debt right now. Okay, the economic reality is that we're in the diversified group. And when you're in the diversified group, I don't know anybody that's gotten out of the diversified group. So one of the things that's going to happen, we're going to close. We'll get a phone call. We'll shut it down hard. Two is, you know, if you do have any heavy capital to survive, it's painful, very painful. And three is, is that, well, maybe someone will pick you up for asset value or something of that nature, right? So I said, do you guys want to buy the company? And I was waiting for that one person to say, this is the lousiest idea I ever saw in my life. And all I saw in their eyes was fear. And it was at that particular point I realized that they would have followed anybody. They would have followed Rin Tin Tin. They would have followed Flicka. Okay, I could, have had, I could have had a talking dog up here, and they would have followed that dog because they just wanted to go somewhere. They didn't want to stay in this abeyance of not knowing what was going to happen to the company. Okay, I had to go back. I wrote this worst letter of intent because I don't know anything about buying companies. Okay, and I said, would you please sell me this? <laughs> I offered them a, a ridiculous uh, low amount of money because we, we didn't have any money, all right? I, mean, I had to borrow. I mean, the only way, only equity I had is I went to buy a suit up in Chicago. The guy sold me a house. <laughs> he was a great salesman, all right. Uh, and and then when they transferred me to Chicago, they had to buy the house, so they got the equity. So the only money I got is the equity in the house, all right. In fact, when my wife and I got married, I I was six hundred dollars in debt, and then she found a shoebox that I didn't hadn't paid bills on. So I was truly negative net worth. <laughs> so I'm writing this letter, and I show it to my controller, and that's what we call financial people, controllers, right? And he looked at me and he goes, this is, he said, this is fraud. He goes, he goes, he goes, he goes, he goes you're going to go to jail. I said, what do you mean I'm going to go to jail? He goes, you can't do this. You don't have any money. You're offering him all this money. All this, this is all lies, you know. And so I, I took it back and I said, all subject to financing. <laughs> and, that famous last line, you know, all subject to financing is my out, right? Well, this is crap. We send the letter up. And here we are. We're in the, we got oh, 200 banks, 6 billion bucks, right? And they get our letter of intent to buy. They've launched two corporate jets. One is full of auditors with black suits, black bags, and black cars, okay? Because I remember pulling up right outside of my office and them coming out with their briefcases, right? And the other one were psychiatrists. Right, because they truly thought we would be giving Kool-Aid to the people on the shop floor. 
because Jimmy Jones or somebody had just wiped out a whole bunch of people in some thinking, well, the Kool-Aid was because who in their right mind would try to buy a business in a capital market where people don't want to lend you money and that's why you have high interest rates. Okay, so who would try to buy something and, and when you can't get any kind of real good financing, right? Well, shit, we didn't know anything about financing. You know, we knew how to build engines, all right? So we passed both tests, and then we go on this journey to borrow money, and I didn't have a business plan. I could tell you my safety statistics. I could tell you my, <laughs> I could, I could tell you my quality statistics. I actually went out and bought a three-piece suit. All right, I thought wingtips would look good and fake laptop computer would look good. You know, I did. I actually had a fake, there was nothing in the computer, okay. And I just wanted to look, I just thought if you look good and you had a really good goal, like saving jobs, that that would matter. I had Ollie White's certificate of supply and inventory. Okay, I got that, all right. I I'd finished college at night school and I supervised and managed all these people and they could care less. First banker I went into could, he didn't even want to know, okay, what the credentials were. He started to ask me the dumbest questions I'd ever been asked in my entire life. The first question he asked me was, well, when are you going to pay this money back? <laughs> and I went and <laughs> I said, wow, really good question, you know? <laughs> I didn't know, I didn't know. I did not know that you were supposed to pay the money back. I thought you just paid the interest. <laughs> You know, I thought it was kind of like a house, you know, I mean, that's all he knew, right, was, you know, you get this long-term, 30-year, you, you don't have to pay it back, you know. Well, needless to say, it didn't take long for him to suggest that I learn more about the acquisition of a business, okay, that it's a lot different than building an engine and having a safety goal. So I began to write these business plans. And uh, it didn't take long for me to realize that in this world, there are actually two sets of metrics in business. The first set of metrics has to do with the product or the service that you're in. I mean, you're doing net promoter scores, or you're trying to figure out customer satisfaction, okay? You're trying to figure out, you know, I mean, you're understanding your customers, okay? And, you know, depending on what kind of a business, whether it's a veterinarian or whether it's a dentistry or whether you're manufacturing, okay? The whole thing, the whole conceptual idea is the product or the service. And if you even look at your job descriptions today, okay? And I would implore you to do this is your job descriptions are probably all centered around asking for accountabilities that are related to the individual tasks that you're asking a person to perform, and very few of your accountabilities are tied to the success of the company. 